Good morning. My name is Scott Stanfield, and this is the Modern Longevitarian, episode 67 with Josh Perry, BMX athlete and uh, brain tumor survivor. We're going to have him on the show just in a couple minutes. And I want to say welcome to everybody watching on the Spirituality Gone Wild Network and also watching on LinkedIn. And uh, this is um, going to be a super cool show because there's so many similarities between Josh and and me and our, our lives and, 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 and the connection like with the, the athletics and the sports and, 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 and the mindset aspect of things. I want to uh, tell you that right now, if you want to work with me and working with a coaching program, you can go to modernlongevitarian.com forward slash coaching, and uh, you can set an appointment to, to do a discovery call with me in like a, a free session where we can dig deep into what your goals are and where you can start and what you can do to get going for, you know, living your life as a modern longevitarian. So without any further ado, I want to uh, go ahead and just move straight into the interview Josh and say, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Uh, it's my pleasure. And, you know, I've done some, you know, a lot of research and listened to other podcasts you're on. And and so I'm, I'm ready to, to share your story and your experience and how your life has changed over the years uh, since you got realized you had the first brain tumor. So um, let's let's back up. Let's tell people about, you know, your 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 life as a, you know, dip, you know, moving from, you know, Massachusetts down to North Carolina to become a pro BMI, excuse me, pro BMXer. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and uh, I mean, like most kids, um, especially out of Cape Cod, where I'm born and raised, I grew up playing all the sports I possibly could. And then around 11, 12, getting used to action sports. And then my 13th birthday, which is right before Christmas, it was like a joint present. Uh, I got my first BMX bike. And that's what kicked off my interest um, that led into a passion that led into an obsession that later on became a career for me. And, you know, moving forward, um, from that moment when I was 13, I got this BMX bike moving into high school at that time, I stopped playing all school sports and I was just focusing on, uh, my BMX riding and then also my education slash career in the workspace because I went to a technical high school. So I could, in my mind, do less school, uh, work because I knew sophomore year, I could enter the co-op program, go to work for two weeks, make money, earn credit, and then go to academics two weeks and cycle on and off. And right. I went for landscaping because I worked for a front of the family's landscaping company. So I got playing school sports, focused on BMX, was working, was getting my schoolwork done. And I had the idea that I would have my own landscaping business one day. And then an ultimatum came from my boss at the time who told me I had to pick between his position he had for me with his company, setting me up for my own business or BMX because BMX and landscaping share the same season. And so I was leaving a lot of different Mondays and Fridays off and stuff like that for contests. And at the time I was 17, I, it was the summer before my senior year and it was a no brainer. And I decided, you know, I'm going to go after this dream and chase it and uh, see how it goes. And then uh, that led into me getting expelled from my senior year because I missed the first 30 days because I was out on some trips and my parents forgot and I forgot that I had school coming up. And so my mom officially signed me out. I dropped out of high school and I moved down to North Carolina out here, um, actually an hour and a half east of where I am now. I'm in Raleigh, but it was in Greenville. That's where Dave Muir was, all the other pros. And I wanted to to make a name for myself. I wanted to have a shot at living my dream and seeing where it could go. And now, uh, now we're here. <laughs> awesome. You know, I remember I was just, as you were telling the story about your first BMX bike, you know, the, my, my the bike I had originally, um, my parents had bought me like a, a Huffy Thunder Trail, but then I wanted like a legit, you know, uh, bike. And I remember cutting grass all summer long to buy with my own money, my diamondback Viper. Right. I don't you remember those or not, but that's, that's was my first, you know, legitimate BMX bike back in one of my teenage years. I don't even know how old I'm getting chills thinking about, you know, all that <laughs> stuff, but, um, you, you know, with that, and then, um, you know, so you move down to North Carolina, you, things are going great. You're starting to compete your friends with Dave Mira, all those things are happening. And then, you find out through an accident, you have a brain tumor, right? Yeah. So starting off the, uh, well, not starting off 2009, but, um, actually no, it was my first contest of the season in April, 2009, I won my first pro contest. Mm -hmm. I think it was my third year competing professionally. 
And then the next day or that same day, actually, I won the best trick contest that won me a Harley, which I cashed in to pay bills for the year. So I was, I was pretty smart with that move back then. Right. Um, yeah. But then two months, three months later, I was in X Games. So it was, you know, a dream come true. But that whole 2009 season, I'd been having these headaches and migraines to the point where they got so severe that they were debilitating and I was vomiting and I was losing my vision on and off throughout the year. And I'd go into the emergency room, the urgent care asking for scans. And they would always tell me, well, no, you're, you know, you, you're healthy, you, you're in shape, you're young, you just have headaches, it's quite normal, take some pain pills, come back if you need more. And that was the go around for a year. And then in March 2010, just a, uh, a training day, I was getting ready for the next contest in April that I won the year prior. And I had learned some new tricks and I wanted to get them dialed on the real ramps before I went to the contest. Um, so for those that don't know, we have foam pits where we practice tricks safely and then we go to like padded ramps and then to the real one. And this one had gone a little wrong. I was transitioning from a seven foot ramp into the foam pit to a six foot ramp on just the real real wood. And so I overcompensated the flip and the rotation of the trick because I was nervous that I'd land on the top of the ramp or something. And right. so, you know, got ejected off my bike, hit my head, got knocked out um, briefly, but I definitely needed an MRI. And now the MRI was deemed necessary after a year, year and a half questing some type of scan in my brain um, because I thought something was going on. And that's when they accidentally diagnosed me with a massive brain tumor. They were looking for signs of TBI and they found a large mass taking over pretty much the left side of my brain. And on the way there, you know, I'm thinking, man, worst case scenario, they tell me I got to take another two weeks off. It already been like two days, which at the time felt like forever. I was like, right. man, two weeks, it'll be all right. And that was it. And then I got there and I'm by myself, I'm living on my own in North Carolina and I, you know, waiting for the report. And I'm thinking two weeks and they tell me, um, you know, all I remember he hearing from the situation was, um, you know, cancer, never going to ride your bike again, you may die. And those were all the words that registered and I just checked out. Wow. That's, uh, so what, what was the next thing you did? I mean, what, what, what'd you do when you found out? I mean, 17 year olds being on your own that you're going to, you know, cancer, you're going to die. I mean, what, what did you do? Well, the first thing I did was I just ran out of there. Um, I just needed to leave. And then I tried to like gather my thoughts. And first thing I did is instinctively was like, I called my mom and I was like, I just got to tell her, but like for like a minute and a half, I couldn't speak. And you know, mm -hmm. she knew something was wrong and then the words finally came out. Uh, and then my, my uh, best friend at the time um, was living with me in North Carolina. He's now back in Massachusetts, but he left work to come, come pick me up and just, you know, be there to support me. And then after the, you know, the pity party, the victim mentality of like literally asking like, why did I deserve this? Like, did I do something like, am I a bad person? Um, the, the transition from diagnosis to surgery was about a week and a half. So mm -hmm. obviously when I got I collected myself the next day, I went to a neurologist, he read the report. And then I found Dr. Alan Friedman here at Duke university who ended up doing my surgery. But during that transition, that week and a half, you know, the, the thoughts started to shift and it was less worry and it was more, what am I going to do when, you know, I get out of the surgery? Like, how am I going to approach my life? And things that helped me with that was my mom's story battling colon cancer. She's alive and well today. And then learning about Lance Armstrong's story, you know, another cyclist, a little different. Their objective is to keep the wheels on the ground. Right. Us, not so much, but right. I couldn't relate to anyone at the time. Like I could kind of relate to my mom, but I was like, they're about to cut open my skull to remove something from my brain. Right. And then I learned about Lance and I was like, man, this guy went through brain, lung and testicular cancer. And right now they don't even know if it's malignant or benign. Um, so I get a pretty good shot. And this guy came back to the level of he was competing at prior and like, all right. So that like, that gave me something to look up to and to model. And I just took those pieces. And at that time I got to the point where there was no room for fear. It was like, this must be done. So that way I can have a shot at preserving my life because if I don't have surgery, it's just a matter of when I'll die. And right. so, you know, the scariest moment of that whole journey was being diagnosed. When like, people talk about fear, that was like the moment that I can vividly feel in my lifetime, like real fear for my life. Right before surgery, it, it, had, it had been enough time to where it was just, it is what it is. I got to do this. And I just treat it like an injury. All right, doc, you know, what do I got to do? Surgery? Cool. When can I get back on my bike? And that's, I believe what helped me, you know, overcome it on top of focusing on the vision that I had for my life. Thankfully, I had a bunch of videos and photos that I was just reviewing and I was just studying BMX and I just focused all my energy on that and what I wanted to be true about my life rather than what if I don't wake up, which is easy to do. 
but I just continued to focus on what I wanted to be true. And then that just, uh, I believe that's why it allowed me not only to have, you know, successful surgery, which, you know, Dr. Alan Friedman has the majority of the responsibility for that, but where I am today, I continued riding at a competitive level, I think for professionally another six years and then just rode at the same level for, um, two more years. And actually this week is a year that I haven't ridden my bike at all. A little different topic. We can talk about that later. But I think that's what's really important is I've reflected on my journey. It's it's not about your circumstances. It's about the vision you have in your mind and how you're going to respond because we can't control things that are out of our hands. The only thing we can control is who we are and how we you know present ourselves to the world and how we respond to things. And I think that's been one of the biggest learning lessons. It's you know it's about what's in your mind, that vision you're working towards, or you can choose you know your circumstances, but you're not going to be empowered that way. Right. Well, it's, you know, the victim triangle versus the victor triangle, right? Which, which yeah. one you're going to live in. Right. And, you know, yes, I mean, I think it's perfectly normal, you know, when, uh, you know, if like, if you're diagnosed with cancer, especially at an early age like that to, you know, like, why is this happening to me? But then for you to transition over really quickly, like, what is my life going to look like afterwards? And then continue to do that and, and, and ride, you know, ride for the next 10 years. I mean, that's just a, this is an amazing piece of the puzzle um, of how the human element can come into play, the mindset aspect of that. Um, so basically you go to the surgery, you have the surgery, and then you're writing again. And then you had some tumors that came back, right? Yeah. So the surgery was six hours. I woke up 75 staples starting here and then went all the way back there, 16 stitches, four titanium screws. And uh, it was Five weeks after surgery, I could I could ride again. I got back on my bike and I slowly ease into things. And then I think another month and a half, two months later, I was in England competing, and it was phenomenal because I thought worst case scenario, you know, or best case scenario, I'm out a year. And right. to find out that I just need to wait four weeks for the skull to fuse back together, and then an additional week just to you know take some more time to rest, I was blown away. And so yeah, I got back to doing my thing relatively soon after surgery, which was phenomenal. And um, so that was April, 2010, I had the surgery. And then September, October area of 2012, a routine MRI showed two masses had grown back on the same side. And Dr. Friedman explained it was because when they got in there, you know, the surgery was supposed to be like four, four and a half hours. But when they got in there, the tumor had wrapped around the optic nerve and the artery, the main artery that run, uh, runs through my brain. And so they couldn't risk hitting either of them because they could have had a stroke, become paralyzed, blind, um, you know, whole, whole host of things. As, and on top of it, I could have just died out on the table. So right. he just, he explained it's just residual cell growth. It's nothing to worry about as far as, you know, immediate attention, because I was in India when I found out about this. Right. And so he's like, just finish your trip, come back. They're about the size of a blueberry, maybe a little bit smaller. So surgery is out of the question, but we'll have to talk about next steps. And so they suggested radiation. I did some, you know, Google searching and I came across technology called gamma knife radiation um, or gamma knife radio surgery. It's a, it's a form of radiation that uses like 180 different degrees of different cobalt bolts. And um, they pinpoint with the computer where to target. And then they all, you know, come together and um, had, you know, extremely high success rates. Um, from my understanding, it doesn't damage the tissue at the same degree that radiation does because they use lesser um, levels until they all come together and um, it's more accurate and all that. So I was like, Man, all right, this sounds good. And then that's what I ended up going through. And then for four years, those two areas continued to shrink slowly over time. And so that was about 2016 is when they stopped shrinking and they've been, they've been stagnant ever since. And then, um, a routine MRI because you know get follow-ups at that point it was like two a year one a year every other year February 2017 a, a third diagnosis showed two new masses on the opposite side of my brain mm. and that's when they told me that they think it's a genetic disorder called neurofibromatosis um, NF2 for short and that diagnosis was coming off of my best year ever competing in 2016 ended up 10th in the world standings I believe and that was after I missed one of five points contests and after an ACL reconstructive surgery. And I just, I put in so much work mentally and physically to get ready for that, had an amazing season. And then 2017, I was on track to do the same thing. I was getting ready to compete even more that year because I was, I was completely healthy. Right. And then that third diagnosis just kind of like, it didn't, it, it was weird because it didn't set me back. It, there was no negative emotions towards it. The first thing I thought of was, 
one, what can I do with this to help me and to help other people? And then from an athletic standpoint and a PR standpoint, I was like, what can I do with this? Like all these things I've been learning through my life of how to take care of myself. I've been sharing with other people and I've, I've fostered a more positive, empowered mindset. And now this, this is happening again. What do I do with this? And it, and it led me to my, what I feel is my true purpose in life that came from chasing my passion. And the purpose was, was a higher intention than myself. BMX was self-serving. My parents were proud of me, you know, other people like great, but what can I do with this to impact people on a larger level? And that's when I decided to take a step away from BMX and focus on what I do today with speaking, creating content that's educational and motivational and my coaching business. And it was that third diagnosis that woke me up to my higher intention in my life that BMX got me to that point. And that's where I am today. And that's when people say like, man, I don't have, a, I don't know if I have a purpose or like, how do I find a purpose? And like, my answer is easy. It's like, you, you gotta go up, chase the things that you love and enjoy and you'll find your purpose along the way. But your purpose always is to become the best version of yourself. But for me, chasing my dream is what led me to my purpose and saved my life. Right. It's a, it's the same thing, right? You know, it's like, if you follow your, I say, I teach people the same thing. You, you find your passion, what you're passionate about. You go down that trail and you may take a right turn at some point because, you know, but what you learn along the way is what you were supposed to learn while you were going down that path. You know, I've had, you know, three distinct, you know, eras of my life, right? You know, racing go-karts from age seven to 21, fully sponsored traveling, you know, winning national state championships, sportsman of the year type things. And I'm so, so it was such a blessing in my life. And then I stopped and then became a restaurant manager, you know, or worked in restaurants and, and became a manager and then director of food and beverage and all these different things. And now I'm doing and all those things I've learned over my whole life. I'm bringing to people now. And, and you talk about your mom having colon cancer. Both of my parents have are cancer survivors um, at age 55. Uh, my dad got prostate cancer a couple years later when my mom was 55. She got uterine cancer. And, um, they, my dad had to go through chemo and surgery and those things. And mom had to have surgery and, uh, dad's 72. Now mom turns 70 in just a couple months. And, um, but, and, and so that was really kind of the catalyst for me to go there, you know, there it's in my genes, right? It's multiple generations. My dad's dad, my dad, me, you know, how do I change this, you know, thing. And then that led me to, you know, down a trail that I all of a sudden, wait a minute, this is epigenetics, right? This is when I first, heard that about, you know, probably eight, eight years ago, Bruce Lipton, you know, the, the company I was working for, the CEO shared me, a, a shared a video with me of Bruce Lipton talking about epigenetics. And that's really what started with you, right? You really started, you know, I think it was Pullmutter's book about epigenetics. It really, you realize that, um, that maybe you've kind of done some of these things to yourself. So um, this is the part of the show where I can title it, right? I told you this in a pre-show, you know, pre but uh, from two liters of Dr. Pepper a day to Bulletproof Coffee. So <laughs> talk about your <laughs> your transition and your diet, your, you know, those type of things, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a miracle I didn't develop type 2 diabetes with the way I live my life. Thankfully, I was super active that, you know, insulin sensitivity was a little bit elevated to combat all that. Um, <laughs> Right. But actually, I have uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief book that I, I haven't started yet, but I've ordered it, and um, I'm excited to read that because I know um, Dr. Joe Dispenza references his work, and then Dr. Um, um, Dr. Matt, what's his last name? One of the founders of, uh, or his father is one of the founders of neurolinguistic programming. Dang, what is his last name? Uh, anyways, he references his Bruce, uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton's work as well in his his books. Um, but yeah, so. Brain tumor diagnosis number one, 2010. That year, a friend shared a documentary on Netflix and it was titled Food Matters. I It's been a year since I've seen it and I wanna do like a live stream of me watching it and just just seeing what I agree with and disagree with now. But that, that film, the way they simply put how your choices in life directly correlate and to a degree affect your overall health in terms of the food you eat was one of the most prominent, obviously food matters, uh, the title right. that got me thinking like, man, like I'm living off so much sugar, so much junk food, a lot of alcohol, um, you know, soda, like all this, let me make some changes. And so I started adding in what I thought was healthy food. And then over the years, it started progressing where I was starting to take things out. I was adding in other things. I was learning about this, learning about that, learning about paleo and all this stuff. And then 
uh, towards the end of 2013, Dr. Perlmutter's book, Grain Brain, came out and a friend of mine gave it to me as a present and I devoured it. And it made so much sense in terms of brain health, performance, longevity, and overall health. Everything starts with the brain. The brain is our operating system of our being. And the way he wrote the book was with the intention of understanding blood sugar regulation and how it affects your brain on so many levels and the ins and the outs of blood sugar regulation, inflammation, cholesterol, fats, all this stuff. And he talked about a low carb ketogenic diet. And I had never really heard of that. I actually never heard of it. That was the first time. And it wasn't very popular back then. So we don't have all these keto brands and supplements like we do today to make it easy. But he also talked about epigenetics and the ability to change your gene expression based on your, how you live your life. And that got me really focused on optimizing how I ate, how I slept, how my thoughts, how or the thoughts I chose to give energy to and all this stuff so much so that it led me into enrolling in a holistic health coaching program because I wanted to learn more and I wanted to be able to help people. And I wanted to have, you know, something to pursue later on after my BMX career. And so I just continued learning. Thankfully, I got introduced to Dr. Uh, promoters work because it led me into learning about Mark Sisson, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Daniel Amen, all these people focusing on either blood sugar regulation and or the brain. And those that know Dr. Uh, Daniel Amen, he's the guy that does all the spect imaging, looking at your brain. Um, MRIs look at the surface and spect looks like internally at blood flow right. and uh, activity and all that. So um, I've been able to connect with all the above except for Dr. Mark Hyman yet. So maybe one day that'll happen. But um, the more I learned from all these people, the more I was being guided in this direction of lowering blood sugar, regulating blood sugar, and then increasing the ability to burn fat to a degree where you can get into the state of ketosis. And that all came in handy when the third diagnosis happened and they told me they thought it because it was benign, they thought it was just a genetic disorder. And I remember epigenetics. Okay. Well, if they're saying this is a genetic thing, then I know I can influence that to a degree and I had already been eating high fat, low carb. I've been, I, I was like under the impression uh, ignorantly that I needed X amount of carbs because I was an athlete and I need to fuel muscle glycogen and all this and that. Now I've learned how that stuff works um, on a deeper level. But that third diagnosis led me into getting a glucometer and a ketone uh, meter and testing my blood, changing up my macros, fasting more, this and that, and then got introduced to Dave Asprey's work. Um, I think actually Dave Asprey's work came into my life a year prior in 2016. A friend of mine was like, hey, you want to drink this this coffee? It's called Boltproof Coffee. And I was like, what's what, what's special about it? He's like, oh, you put in like fat like from butter and ghee and you blend it up. And I was like, it sounds weird, but I'll try it. And it was really good. And I've been forcing myself at the time to drink coffee like the last year or two up to that point because of Dr. Perlmutter's work. And I was like, man, this is so good. And so <laughs> – it, that's what led me onto the journey of getting into ketosis, maintaining that state, educating myself on it. And uh, because of that, no medication, no surgery, no treatment, um, year after year, MRI showed no progression of those tumors that popped up. And I, I would assume because of the year, year and a half where they did show up, clean scan, oh, you have four tumors now, you have two new ones. And then year after year after that, nothing. That's what has convinced me that the way I live my life inside and out is what's combating that the progression of them. And, you know, with the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton, Dr. Joe Dispenza, um, adding to the mental and emotional pieces of that to epigenetic, you know, levels, I'm confident that we'll see them starting to shrink over time and um, not even be a thing. So you know, that was a long winded answer of how epigenetics came into my life and what it's done for me so far. Well, you know, the, the same thing for me, right? You know, I, the cat, the catalyst for me was when my parents got cancer. And then since they've gotten cancer, I've gained 40 pounds and lost it twice. The last time was, you know, the, you know, nine years ago, I started on it. I was, as I was December of uh, nine years ago, I was 39 years old. I was getting ready to turn 40. I'm like, I'm going to go to the doctor and take a victory lap. I've been a vegetarian for like, you know, eight years and you know, my blood, I'm going to, all these things are going to be great. Right. And, uh, and I go to the doctor and I'm 40 pounds overweight because my scale at home was off by 20 pounds. I thought I was like 185. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm about 20. That's not so bad. You know, be turning 40. And next thing I'm 202 on the scale. And I was like, what? I'm a fat vegetarian. Right. What in the heck's going on? And very similar to you. Um, what happened was the next step was, is I went at 35, I lost the 40 pounds, but I did it by doing P90X. I don't know if you remember, Tony Horton and the P90X program. I had a friend right? who was obsessed with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I did it for 60. I lost the weight in 60 days. 
because my parents' house in South Carolina had caught on fire and burnt down and I went back to help them and I'd got the stomach, a stomach virus or something like that and, or food poisoning. And so that kind of broke the momentum and I never went back and did the last 30 days. And so I never did the full, never still to this day, you know, have done the full P90X 90 day program. And, um, but, but my point being is that at age 40, it was a little bit more difficult. I started doing P90X. I lost 10 pounds in a, in a month and I was working at a hospital as a director of food and beverage. And one of the marketing people, uh, Matt Shannon, actually, um, uh, he was working for the, the doctors that did all the gastric bypass surgeries, right? Where they're putting lap bands and stapling stomachs and those type of things. And he said that I, he heard one of the doctors say that weight loss is 70% diet. And I'm like, I'm 40 pounds overweight. I put these two together. I'm 40 pounds overweight. Um, and I, ex- I, cha- I started exercising more, but I didn't change my diet. And somebody had gifted me the book called The Warrior Diet, which is one of the very first books on intermittent fasting. And basically, it's a 20-hour under eating and then a four-hour feeding window um, that we now call one meal a day, right? O- OMAD is what we call this particular pro- profile of intermittent fasting. I, the month prior, I lost 10 pounds. In that week, I lost seven pounds. And what I realized is that even though I was still vegetarian, still eating high carb, but because I was going 20 hours with this underfeeding stage, that my body was going into ketosis, you know, at some point in the afternoon before I ate dinner at like six o'clock in the evening. And, uh, and, and so I ate from six to 10 and I did I ate too late, you know, when I ate too much and those type of things, but, um, it was a gift, right? Is to, and so nine years later, I still intermittent fast, right? Um, this morning in honor of, I knew we were going to talk about Bulletproof coffee. I actually made a Bulletproof coffee this morning, which I normally do just on Sundays because I want to keep my body used to processing the MCT oils and and those things because it can mess with your intestines and stuff like that. But, um, but I, the same thing I and then I started putting these pieces together, mindset, breath, hydration, sleep, fuel, fuel, which is food, really movement, Wim Hof method, saunas, which is getting uncomfortable and then connecting with community and family and, and nature. And so I, it was a long process for me to understand what those pieces of the puzzle were to about epigenetics. And, and so what happened was that I was losing this weight and people kept focusing so much on my fasting and diet that I said, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm a longevitarian. And that's where this is all came from. And longevitarian.com was already taken. I own it now though. And, but this is a modern longevitarian because, you know, Let's see, people who live in the blue zones don't have to deal with, you know, two liters of Dr. Pepper being cheaper than water, right? Which is why you were drinking Dr. Pepper to save money. Yep. Yep. And 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 so so epigenetics, and so you still have the four brain tumors, right? You're still living with those, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. And so you're controlling that, and that's what I put, you know, how you know you're 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 living with these tumors and you're controlling it with lifestyle. And that's really what I, the message I want to get across today. And so You've done multiple things, you know, like being keto, low carb, you know, bulletproof coffee um, and tapping into the meditation and those type type of, of things. Um, and so I don't I talk for a long time. I normally don't talk that long when I have a guest on. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. So the, the concept I live my life by is asking, are you at effect or are you at cause for your reality? So with me living with four brain tumors, I could easily live out of fact and be worried about all these things happening or what is my health going to be like or, you know, all, all of these things. But like that's being defined by my circumstances. I choose not to. That's what led me to becoming a professional athlete, which is not an easy thing to do, let alone in BMX and then make a living off of that for over 10 years, starting out as a teenager. And then that's what led me through overcoming the injuries and the brain tumor diagnosis, not just one, two, or three. Um, it's it's being defined by a vision that I hold in my mind that I'm working towards, but it's being at cause for my reality. When I started learning about nutrition, when I started learning about mindfulness and meditation and epigenetics and all of these factors, I chose to be at cause. I'm doing this when I could be doing that. This is optimal. I'm doing this. Two liter Dr. Pepper or black coffee, bulletproof coffee, whatever you want to say, water, that could be optimal. And so I chose to take the empowered route of being at cause for my reality. As soon as I acknowledged that I'm the problem for everything that I experienced, good or bad, and that I'm choosing to do those things, mostly unconsciously, because that's how our brains work, 
that was ex the very moment that allowed me to be empowered and saying, well, I'm also you know, responsible for all the positive things that have gone on in my life and I can change. And I've already done this once with overcoming a brain tumor. I did it before that, leaving home to you know fulfill a dream as a child. Um, you know, it's funny when we're younger, we're like, "Oh, I'm 17, I'm 18, I know everything." And it's like, no, like you're such a child. Um, <laughs> even in your 20s, I mean, I'm only 32, and I'm just like reflecting on the last 10 years, you know. But the the over overlying theme here that my family taught me and that BMX taught me and that I taught myself is to be at cause for my reality, to work for the life I want, but it doesn't have to be work really hard or it's got to be a struggle. Like all those limiting beliefs are just filters that create the experience that we see each day and that we have. And so, you know, me living with four brain tumors, I'm not defined by that. And I've worked really hard this last year internally to not be defined by the BMX thing. You know, I was this from a, from a young age on, I was identifying as an athlete. And then for you know over a decade, I could identify as a professional BMX athlete. And then when I stopped, you know, I was like, well, who am I? You know, and I, I was on the fence because I was still riding at that same level, not competing, not working with brands or anything like that. But I was just still like in limbo. I didn't know who I was. And then my girlfriend, Jackie, finally explained it. She's like, you're going through this, you know, I call it like this, you know, late twenties crisis of who am I? She's like, you're breaking up with your first love, essentially. Like the first thing you love besides your friends and family, you're, you're leaving that. And that's a big part of your identity. And what I've learned is like, we don't, we can choose this. I should say, I choose not to be defined by what I used to do or what I do. I choose to be defined by who I believe I am and what I'm working towards. That vision is what defines me. So coming back to the four brain tumors, it's nothing to me. It's, it's obviously there's risk involved, but there's risk involved walking outside to your car. There's risk involved, you know, having a conversation with someone that you don't know or eating this food from that restaurant or whatever. There's always risk. The difference is what are you choosing to focus on? Because what you focus on unconsciously and consciously, you're putting your energy towards that. And that's going to either affirm everything that you don't want to be true about your life or affirm the opposite, everything you do want to be true. And that piece of your identity is going to lead to the behavior that you take unconsciously mostly. And then that's going to manifest the reality that you experience on day to day. And a great book on that, that sums all that up really well is called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And that book has just been revolutionary for me, just understanding all these things that I've been experiencing and going through. And then now it's like, all right, cool. Like this is what's going on now. Okay. What's next? Right. You know, I have four brain tumors. Cool. What am I going to do about it? I could sit here and whine about it. Probably not too many people would judge me about it. They'd be, they'd be oh yeah, no, that makes sense. Like that sucks. Like that's great. Or no, what am I going to do about it? What do I want to be true about my life? That's what I'm going to do. Right. And by me living my life through leaving home, dropping out of high school, going after BMX, and then now leaving BMX to start my own business, like all these things, and me sharing along the way, I've noticed people have taken inspiration from that because it inspired a new perspective or a belief in them. I never fathomed that being a thing. I never fathomed being invited on podcasts, being on stages, speaking, and all these things, but it's just a part of my journey. And right. so... I just continue to choose to be defined by what I want to be true about my life and share that message because at the end of the day, whatever you want to believe could be true. Whatever you're looking for, you'll find. You can either be the victim at effect for your life. Oh, this happened to me. Life sucks. It's their fault. It's not me. It's got to be that. I just wasn't raised with a bunch of money or whatever it is. Or you can choose to be defined by the vision you're working towards, be at cause and work for the things you you want to be true about your life. It's easier said than done, but I choose to share because I believe I'm a living example that didn't come from money, had to sell things and work hard to get like, you know, low end bike products and then work a job to do this and that. And then went through multiple brain tumor diagnosis, injuries. I was living out of my car at one point. I was living on my younger brother's couch at one point. You know, all these things I've gone through. You know, my mentor, Dave Mira, he ended up taking his life, was diagnosed with CTE. Two years later, my younger brother took his life. Like all of these things have happened in my life, but I choose to take away what I can, as difficult as that is, and not to dismiss I'm a human being. I think too, too, many, too often do people get caught up in thinking, they're wrong for their feelings. Your feelings are your feelings. The difference is, is what you choose to do moving forward. Things happen, especially things out of our control, which is pretty much everything besides your being. You can't change that. What you can change is how you respond, not how you react, because react, reactions are automatic. Response takes some time. 
you can choose to respond one way or another. And depending on what you choose, there's no right or wrong. You're just going to get an outcome. It could be what you want or it could be what you don't want. And either one is going to fuel you one way or another. And it's just, I just can't stress that point enough. Asking yourself, are you at effect right now or are you at cause? Being at a cause is difficult, but it's so worth it. It is. It is so worth it. You know, because, you, you know, when you're asking what you can do, that puts you in such a powerful place, right? It's um, and realizing you're human along the way where you're like, instead of asking what, when you're at cause, when you're at effect, and I love the way you put that is you're asking, why is this happening to me? Right. You're the, the, the thing is, is like the Einstein quote about the first decision you have to make is whether you live in a friendly or hostile universe, right? Hostile universe is as you are at effect, right? And, and this is happening to me instead of life is happening for me. I live in a friendly universe. And because what happens is like the same thing. There's so many things, so many similarities. I stopped racing, you know, at age 21, I broke up with my first love of go-karts. I was going to be a NASCAR driver. That was my whole dream, my whole life. All right. I stopped racing. I didn't watch a race for four years on TV. I didn't watch NASCAR to do any of those things. One of my team, one of my teammates, Michael Herman Jr. Um, he's one, he's the head spotter for Roush racing, you know, and, you know, and I'm, I'm reconnected with a lot of these people that, have worked in NASCAR. There's people that I raced against that actually drove like Elliot Sadler, you know, um, you know, raced a bunch in NASCAR and Lyndon Amick and Jason Keller, you know, these guys that I raced against in, you know, in the Southeast, they made it to NASCAR and they did those things. And, you know, I didn't, you know, but it, it, it's like, that's fine with me now. But then I was defining myself by if I had the sexy job as a restaurant manager, you know, and was I, you know, was there, you know, like during Sundance, you know, Brad Pitt comes in or when I was in Santa Monica, you know, uh, which actors coming in today. Right. And, and, and those type of things like Wayne Brady used to have conversations with him and, and talk to him and those things. But now that I'm not in the restaurant business and I'm doing this, you know, it's like I'm, I'm really more defining like who I am as a person versus what job I have or what I do. And I don't know if you heard of this book, but it's um, it's right up here. It's um, Todd Herman's The Alter Ego Effect. Have you heard of that one yet? I have not. I have not. Yeah, it's super cool because um, basically he uses four alter egos. But um, and it's what happens is, is that like he puts on for like 15 years, he puts on some non prescription glasses and he pretends when he's on stage, he's Clark Kent, right? That he's really Superman behind the scenes, but he's on stage being Clark Kent. And when he puts the key in the door to go home with his family that and his children, that he's Mr. Rogers, right? He goes, steps into that alter ego. He did a bunch of, when this book came out, he did more podcasts than I'd ever seen anybody do podcast it to promote the book. I think he did something like a, over, well over a hundred. And I like listening to the different podcasts and different interviews to see what different pieces of, they talk about the book and those type of things, mm -hmm. but he works with top athletes. And what he realized is that like, he mentioned like um, Kobe Bryant's Mamba mentality. I don't know if you heard about, you know, the mm -hmm. black Mamba and what Kobe did with that and had this alter ego when he went, stepped on court, when he was at the gym practicing and, and those things. And but that was a big turning you know point for me as well. Like when I'm with my family, that's a version of Scott, but I could use this idea of, uh, of, of an alter ego like Mr. Rogers to be kind and get on their level and, and, and be with them. And, and then yet when I wanted to, um, you know, be at work or in, in a certain environment, like right now I'm the modern longevitarian, right. You know, and have those different things. And so I encourage you to check it out. And I haven't dug deep into atomic habits, but because if you talk about it so much, I'm definitely going to, to, to do that as well. Um, but I, so many, so many similarities and, and I love, love what, where you're at and what you're doing and the message you're bringing. And I wish that when I was 32, I was thinking about the things that you're thinking about, you know, it's just like, it's amazing. <laughs> I've been hearing that quite a bit. And then I think, well, I was 21 when I had diagnosed with a brain tumor. So maybe that kickstarted my, my jump on self-improvement and empowerment. It had to, right. You know, it's like, uh, it, you know, where most of us, you know, we don't really think about, you know, we think about, Hey, we're going to die one day, but it's going to be years from now. Right. We don't really like, how do I, you, you were hit in the face, right. And you were punched in the mouth, right. With something that you really had to like, face and go, what am I going to do? And mm -hmm. what's my life going to look like after that? And it accelerated it for, for you. Right. And, um, it's a gift that you get to give to the world. And so, um, I'm, I'm glad we can, we can share this here. So, um, what, what other, 
you know, well, what, so what's next for you on the horizon? I mean, you're, you're obviously got a coaching business. You went to and became a integrative, you know, holistic health coach and you're doing those, those things. And so what else are you doing to bring the message to the world about epigenetics and those type of things? Yeah. And I should add to that. I actually leave tomorrow for a four day, um, NLP workshop, like certification training. I'm more interested in just like the, the training and all that stuff, but, um, that's what we were talking off air earlier. You know, I, I've been impacted in such a way from the mental and emotional aspects of being a human being and working on that and learning about it, that I've incorporated that into working with clients to where, you know, food, nutrition, fasting, ketosis, exercise, supplements, whatever, like all that comes after. Because first we got to get in there. We got to see what kind of programming is going on. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, I, I had to do. And I have been so profoundly impacted with it. And, you know, just seeing, you know, the clients I've worked with through that, it's just, it's night and day compared to the clients I used to work with in terms of the value I was getting or I was giving them. And then I was trying to figure out, I was like, well, why do some clients stay with this and some don't, and they come back later on again. And it's like, it's the mental and emotional aspects. Cause if you're operating off limiting beliefs or negative emotions, then, you know, you're, you're going to be able to achieve success, you know, maybe not, but you're also not going to be able to sustain it very long because those old patterns are going to keep popping back in. And so I've just been uh, really interested in all, like, you know, Dr. Joe, Dr. Bruce Lipton and all that stuff. Um, Cause I think it's everything. I think everything else is just, you know, a tool in the arsenal, but you really got to figure out what kind of programming or what kind of lens or filters you have on your life and what's possible for your reality. Um, so yeah, I mean, besides coaching and speaking, obviously speaking has been put on hold slash turned virtual uh, this last year with COVID and all that. Um, but you know, I, I'm always trying to create content that's either motivational, educational, or something like that. I was always trying to provide value and context. I love talking about context. Um, not everything is so black and white. And, uh, that's what I've learned through the nutrition stuff too. And you know, the term bio individuality, I think it's really important for people to understand that. Uh, but besides that, you know, I hold two board seats, um, the athlete recovery fund. They were, they were a huge help to me when I got diagnosed with a brain tumor when I was 21 and they helped out with medical bills that my health insurance didn't cover. And they flew my parents out to stay with me, um, put them up in a hotel and all sorts of stuff like that. And they, that's their main mission, right? Is to give back to action sports athletes and, um, in that type of way. And then I also sit on the board for a organization called staff strong. That is, um, you know, They've been around about three years now, almost a half a million raised now, which is amazing. And they're all about raising funds for GBM, uh, glioblastoma brain tumors um, for cancer research. And then um, they're doing a lot of cool stuff like that. And um, they do uh, some grant work and stuff like that as well. Um, and the long-term vision is to have the Josh Perry Foundation up and running. And I um, I have some uh, some things in the works. I don't know when it'll be want to be out there, but that's, that's the someday goal I want to work on. I want to be able to, to, um, mostly I want to be able to fund grants for families in need of health, uh, related things, whether it be, you know, MRIs, gamma knife, nutrition, uh, meditation, yoga, like whatever someone may need that wants the holistic approach and top of, you know, the modern medicine route. I just want to be able to provide grants because I don't see much I see a lot of research and awareness for any any disease or thing like that and that's all great and important but being the person in those shoes and needing that support I want to be able to provide that um, and then on top of it my goal this year is by the end of the year to get my book edited and published I wrote it last year and I added a little bit more over the last uh, couple of weeks months and um, now I'm just working on going through and editing it and uh getting that out. So my, my, my big goal for me this year is to get that published. It's been a long time in the making and I'm glad I waited to get it done this year. Cause a lot's changed. A lot of learnings have come from it. And, um, my goal with that is just like everything. I, I don't want people to feel like they're broken or be embarrassed about something or feel alone or isolated. I want people to feel empowered and I want them to know they're not alone and that they can look to someone that, you know, maybe looks like them or comes from a similar background that didn't have an upper hand and was able to overcome things and create the life that um, that person wanted. And I believe that we're all capable of that in our own ways. It may not be what we logically think we want, but what I've learned is that's not always what's necessary. Um, I thought I was going to ride my bike until I couldn't anymore. I'm very capable now, and I've chosen to walk away to fulfill a different purpose in life that came from my being my passion. And so I just want people to know, like, if I can do these things, if I can change my diet, if I can change my mindset, if I can change my income, if I can change my career, my education, my relationships, like all these things, then then so can you. And so um, that's the goal with my book and everything I do. It's just to 
be of be of service to other people really that's amazing um what's the working title for your book what do you have you know planned for that uh got it fierce is a thought thoughts can be changed and i'm working on like a subtitle um not quite sure yet but just ideas i'm throwing around are just you know what living with four brain tumors uh, brain tumors has taught me about fear something like that but who knows um i'm not an expert on book titles and all that so <laughs> i know the title for sure is it has to be fierce is a thought maybe the thought of the subtitle could be thoughts can be changed i don't know but that's definitely right. what i'm going with right i mean there definitely has to you know be something in about the you know the brain tumors and you know, it's but your your headshot that I use for the, you know, the sh you know has you sitting, you know, like this with yeah. fears of thought, you know, thing on there, and um, which is you know, let's talk about that for a second, you know, because um, I know you use something similar to um, I've heard people call it bear, which is belief, emotions, actions, results, or um, and and you know I was taught TFAR, which is thoughts, feelings, actions, results. I know um david bear i don't know if you've heard of david bear he's got he, his book is a free download called mind hack and but he teaches people how to run their how to optimize their businesses but he starts with mindset the same thing you do as well and and where i'm migrating to as well that that mindset and changing these limiting beliefs and the story we tell ourselves is by far the most important piece of the whole puzzle um but yeah let's talk with fears or thoughts and thoughts can be changed let's talk about that yeah, I mean, if you think of fear, it's just an emotional response. Um, it's it's not it's not real. It's just a biochemical response that we feel. Like our emotions are, like Dr. Joe says, the language of the body. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are the language of the mind. And so, with fear just being a thought, it fears just an emotion that's triggered by a thought, mm -hmm. and that usually will influence how we behave. You know, if we see a lot of traffic, you know, we're not going to want to go run across the street because there's fear of getting hit by a car. Right. Um, but then you have the un, or how would I word it? Like just the non-serving fear. That's like, oh, I have to give a presentation that could change my world in a positive manner, and I'm afraid they're going to judge me. And then you start having that emotional reaction that you feel. That's not going to save your life the same way fear for traffic or fear falling off a building or a cliff would be. So, fear is a thought. Thoughts can be changed. That that was my first tattoo right when I was about 27, 28. And it came at a pivotal moment. I believe it came right, it had to have been right before, right after the third diagnosis, somewhere around then. I'd have to look at my tax yeah. records. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it, it's just a reminder that fear isn't, it isn't in control. It's going to, like Jim Carrey worded it amazingly in that, that famous speech he gave um, years ago. He displayed that massive painting as well. But he's like, you know, he said fear is going to be a player in your life. But what's cool is you choose how much playing time fear has. Mm -hmm. And so fear just being a thought, thoughts can be changed to me is, is self-empowerment. And that's why I got tattooed in my arms because I want to be able to see it. And I want that, like that every bit of that feeling and the uncomfortableness to be embedded in me because it's not what dictates my life unless I allow it to. And I think that's one of the most important things that we have to remember is our thoughts and our emotions don't. They don't run the show. We run the show, but usually it's unconscious programs that have been picked up over the years that creates filters on our lives that we see it as. And so an acronym that was shared with me four or five years ago is TEAR, T-E-A-R. Thoughts, emotions, actions, results, or I like to say reality. So it starts with your thoughts, auditing your thoughts because that's going to dictate how you feel every day. And how you feel every day or more days than not is going to dictate the actions you take. And those actions you take are going to manifest the results that you see in your life or the reality you experience. And James Clear talks a lot about that and how to change things in his book, Atomic Habits, which is just basically a blueprint for creating change. Um, right. He's very well versed in NLP and psychology, and you can see it in his, in his writing if you're familiar with that. So. Right really just fears as a thought. It's just that it's just simple. It's not easy to change because it's hardwired into our brains and it becomes a part of our identity. And so what I believe you have to start with is acknowledging your thoughts. And that's where meditation comes in. That's where journaling comes in. Like that's where just doing something to clear your mind. Like I love float tank therapy. Like that's an amazing thing or even psychedelics. I mean, it, it's just anything you can get to a place where you recognizing your thought process, your programming for who you are essentially, 
then you'll be able to make connections with how you feel and then the events that have occurred, how the feelings were there and then the patterns and then the behavior that comes after that. And then you find out where you are today is just a nonstop, you know, roller coaster and snowball effect of all these different thoughts and emotions and actions and experiences that led you to today. And what's cool is you can change that. And it's not about being perfect. It's not about perfection. It's about, if you look at it as like a vote, it's not about getting, I know it's a pretty hot topic right now, but it's not about getting a, a hundred percent votes towards the type of person you want and the life you want. It's about getting a majority vote. And so for example, if your goal is to be healthy and you're hitting snooze in the morning when you're meant to get up early and go work out, or you get, you know, some processed food instead of, you know, some whole food, like a steak or a salad or a fish or chicken, whatever it is, Every choice you make is a vote towards the type of person you want to become, therefore being a vote for the life that you will have, whether you like it or not. It's just, it's simple, but the, the difficult part is rewiring the brain, re rewiring those limiting beliefs and those thought processes to serve you rather than make your life harder and to affirm your limiting beliefs and insecurities. Because that's what our brain is unconsciously always comparing, contrasting who we believe we are to the external world. That's why social media can be such a dangerous thing if you're not aware of it. And so for me, when I caught on to this, I started unfollowing people that I looked up to because I was seeing a reflection in myself that's like, oh, like that's gotta be so cool. Like, why don't I have that and all that shit? So I was just like, nope. I'm not gonna follow them, I, I love them maybe, I support them, cool, but I need to work on myself. And now I'm in a place where it's like, okay, it's just automatic. I just think like, what am I thinking? Because I feel this way, let's change right. that behavior. Right, yeah, and that's the key to it, right? Because, um, you, you know, because your beliefs, can you can change your thought, right? If you put yourself into this fear state or fight or flight or um, one person, or David Bayer decides it as a suffering state. There's only two states of being, suffering, are, are, are beautiful and they pair up with our autonomic nervous system. So fight or flight is suffering fear state and this productive rest, relax, digest health state is the parasympathetic. And I call that living in power. So this power mode on and regulating myself from the negative back into the positive side of things. And, and, and so having like this ninja level, you know, self-awareness and this ninja level self-regulation process and asking myself what, what we're thinking. And, and it's, there's two, I have so many questions and stories and all this stuff, and we don't have enough time to do them all. But like, we, if we, if we have a spider in the house, if my daughter sees it, she freaks out because she's just, she's afraid of what might happen. Her imagination's taking her to this really scary place to where my, my, my wife or I, when we see the spider, we know that we can just, you know, get it into a jar, take it outside or something along those lines. So our response to that spider is completely 180 degrees from each other because of that. And, and the same thing happens with the story talking about cr crossing through traffic or your phone rings, you know, and it's like, it could be like, Hey, the, this is a certain person calling me. You could predetermine what the actual conversation might be. And it might be completely different than that. And so it's super, super amazing um, with, with all these things that, that are happening. Um, I got it. We got a couple of comments that came in. So Sharon dropped in three. Uh, actually, we have uh, before that we have Juliet. She said, uh, Julietta, she said, hello. So thanks for watching the show. And then um, back when we we're talking about Bulletproof Coffee, Sharon said, I love Bulletproof Coffee. It's been a while. And then she said, um, and by the way, Sharon, thanks for watching the show. I know you mentioned in the notes earlier that you were, or the comments you're going to be watching. So thanks. Um, in September, 2010, I had a sudden cardiac arrest, had to learn to control my health since then. Excited to hear your wisdom. So she's excited to hear about you, Josh. So awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And then she said, um, are you living at cause or effect right now? Great question. So, um, thanks. Glad that Sharon. resonated. Yeah. I mean, yeah, me too. And that's the whole point, right? Uh, I'm where you can't see it, but I'm wearing my hoodie and the blowfish. Um, <laughs> sure today, but, um, I'm from South Carolina. They're, they're from South Carolina and connected at university of South Carolina. But, um, a, a really quick, funny story is that I was on call carpool karaoke with Darius Rucker oh, um, when I was in California, I got you know, in this group, Facebook group I was in about hooting the blowfish. If you like singing karaoke, uh, and you like hooting the blowfish, uh, send me an email and I got chosen. Right. So 10 days later, I'm in a car with Darius Rucker and uh, Anthony Davis, the actor, 
and driving them through a car wash and, and Darius is playing his guitar in the back seat, singing, hold my hand. All right. In the next three days, the fear of other people's opinion about me being on that show paralyzed me, mm. absolutely paralyzed me. Now here's what happened when the show came out weeks, late months later, every single comment was positive or, and or jealous of the fact that it was me and not them. Right. Even my cousin was saying, I wish it would have been me. And, you know, my best friend from college was like, why were you, why were you, it was my band first, right? Not, you know, and those things I'm like, well, they needed somebody to represent from South Carolina and you were there and I was in California. So I just got to stand in as the representative. Right. But that was such a major learning curve for me that like when I started doing things online like this, is that I'm going to get, I'm, there may be a couple of people that, that are not supportive of what Scott Stanfield's doing with the modern Algebitarian or beginning time was the restaurant general manager podcast that I was doing, but you know what? People are really supportive and I don't need to have fear of other people's opinion. Right. And because I just had to change my thought right around that. I was really fearful of it. And, and now this is episode 67 of a live show that I do every weekday. Right. So yeah, it's, congrats, man. It's, it's a truth. Thanks, man. And, and because October a year ago, I was I was in tears about just recording a video, much less doing a live show <laughs> with someone like you, right? You know, and doing this, or you know, yesterday with Dr. Anthony J, who's got a you know best selling book called Esther Generation, which I don't know if you've seen that or not, but about estrogens in our environment and how they impact uh, uh, you know our lives and like if you you put just a small amount of estrogen in water and you put a frog in there, the frog will change from male to female. Mm. And this, this stuff is in our drinking water, it's in our foods, it's in the plastics, it's in all these different things. And so um, I, you, I, I highly encourage you, since you're looking at epigenetics, epigenetic expression, um, what we talked about yesterday was how it carries from generation to generation, right? And, and, and it's not just like a singular, like, hey, I can change my mindset or I can drink cleaner water or eat clean food or be keto or paleo or vegetarian or vegan and I'm okay. The negative and the bad choices we make actually passes to the next generation. So yeah, if that's, that's such a profound thing, especially with stress and fear. And then on a cellular level, it's programmed. You're just hardwired to be in you know protection mode all the time. And on the note of hormones, that's what I'm working with my functional medicine doctor with um, is you know post TBI. Uh, hormonal dysregulation and stuff like that. So it's very fascinating learning more about that. But then obviously with the foods and the water and just the plastics and yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty scary, but it can be pretty liberating if you take the right approach and which is what I'm sure you got it from that episode. Absolutely. Right. And I'd actually had seen this years ago. And so we had already changed away from, you know, deodorants that have aluminum and titanium in there. And we don't really wear sunscreen. We, you know, we haven't for years. We believe that, you know, we should get our vitamin D from the sun when we go to the beach and, and those things. And so um, we don't put things on our skin that actually would block the sun absorption. We have to be careful of not getting sunburned, but we live here at 7,000 feet uh, in, in the mountains of Park City, Utah. And we, we moved from the Caribbean. We lived on St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands for two years. And because of the altitude, we actually get burnt easier here than we did when we lived in the Caribbean is you would tan yeah. in the Caribbean and you get burnt in the, in the mountains. And so it's really, you know, you know, living in these different parts of the world, you learn, you know, how the, the, the climate and the, you know, and elevation changes things. And, 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 and so we've, we gone, we had gone down that trail years ago, no fluoride, you know, we reverse osmosis systems, those things, but to see the level he took it to and then understand you know, that the, the marks on the DNA through epigenetics that could actually go to the next generation, that was so eye opening for me. And I was like, wow, you know, when my son goes out, you know, or, you know, goes out and says, Hey, you know, I went to Jimmy John's and I had this, you know, he's like, I'm young. It's not going to kill me. Right. Like you and I were thinking with well, my six pack of diet, do it, you know, di or not diet, but regular amount do a day, your two liters of Dr. Pepper. It may actually hurt us in the in the short run, but it's also hurting the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, and and there's so many th pieces of the of, of those things. So, yeah, um, and, for and sure. So and something you mentioned earlier that I wanted to just quickly address is you know the fear of other people's comments and all that. Something that has allowed me to be even more empowered in those situations is understanding no successful happy person will ever say something negative 
to another person. No one that is in the position of success and health and happiness will try to put someone else down. That usually is a projection of other people's own insecurities and then them projecting that onto you because you're mirroring something inside of them that they're not doing. And that's, that's always helped me uh, or hasn't always, it's helped me the last few years understanding like anything that I want to do. And I'm afraid of someone else judging me, you know, no one that is healthy, happy, and successful is going to judge me in a non-productive manner. Critiquing may be one thing, but for someone to just, you know, full on try to tear someone else down, that's that in my mind is always a projection of their own insecurities coming out. Absolutely. You know, it's old crabs in the pot, right? The one crab tr tries to climb out, the, you know, the other crabs are pulling them back in, right? Yep. And, 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 and that, and you're right, you know, and we're a, you know, an average of the people we spend the most time with, right? And, um, and, and, and if somebody's being negative towards you, there may be, there may be somebody you need to cut out of your life, right? You know, because it's like, we want to be around people who are supporting your goals, where you want to go, you know, where, where you are and those things. And it's, it's so, so important. Um, so, um, Josh, where can people find you online? Uh, my website is joshperrybmx.com. And that's the same for all my social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. I think that's it. Um, I think that's all. I'm just Josh Perry BMX. I, um, talked about URLs earlier and, uh, joshperry.com wants five grand. They're not using it, but they want five grand for it. And I just haven't brought myself around to, uh, purchasing that. I just, I can't, I just, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. So right now everything's just Josh Perry BMX. Right. Well, there's, um, at last time I counted, there's 16 different Scott Stanfields in, uh, in the United States. Um, in Scott Stanfield.com has been taken for years. So I own something I own like Scott R Stanfield.com, but I, I never have done anything with it, but I owned modern longevitarian for nine years before I ever, you know, put a website or eight and a half years before I ever put a website to it. Um, so I'm kind of like this domain name collector, right? <laughs> um, I did get my book title URL. So that is, that is a good, good thing. <laughs> that is, that's amazing. Right. And that was only $18 for the year. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. And so it's just, uh, I probably have right now, probably about, I've owned so many of them over the years, but some I've let expire. But, um, one of my email addresses is straight cabbage at gmail.com and so i have straightcabbage.com and i don't know what i'll ever do with that but um <laughs> i had a blog with that and it's an old snowboarding term it's like that means it's like a super gnarly trick right oh that was so straight cabbage you know or, or something like that and then we live in the in, in the mountains and you know all those things so i've had that for a long time um you know so you're also on linkedin you put a lot of long form content on linkedin as well and that's how we met so um, I don't think you mentioned that as well. Is that is that the same thing, Josh Perry BMX at, on yeah. LinkedIn as well? Yeah, LinkedIn.com backslash Josh Perry BMX. I try to make everything just super universal and just clean. And um, yeah, my LinkedIn activity the last couple of months, I'd say, is thanks to uh, my buddy Mark Metry, who's uh, pretty uh, LinkedIn savvy, if you will, and uh, encouraged me to post more articles and just post more on there. And so I've just been trying to yeah, try and do my best from what I'm learning and just see if I can optimize my efforts and reach more people. And it, I guess it worked because it led us to having this conversation. So I, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it, it did. You know, I heard Gary V say just over two, about two years ago, uh, that LinkedIn was at the same place Facebook was four or five years ago. And I, at the time I had 3,200 connections, you know, I now have, I had been up to 30,000 connections before I deleted some, some people who were out of the country and, and things like that. But, um, you know, I have, I think over 29,000 followers here. And so a lot of people get to see these things we put out and my, which is, uh, and I'm, and I'm working even, you know, you know, harder on that to optimize this. I am on Facebook. I am on YouTube. I am, I do have an Instagram, you know, channel and you know, those things, but, um, LinkedIn is where I get most of my, my action from. And a lot of it has to do because I was able to connect with people in the restaurant world, you know, um, restaurant managers, recruiters, chefs, sous chefs, servers, bartenders, those things. And it was funny when I was managing my last restaurant, I had, you know, you know, I was up, I was for about 20,000, you know, followers. I put in all this content and one of the servers come up. It was like my first week it came up because I did some research on you and he started quoting some of my stuff on LinkedIn. And I was like, Holy cow. Right. And, um, and I interviewed a manager that was like, had listened to podcasts I've been on talk about things. And so if you're doing your transition and a side hustle doing this, 
you got to be careful what you put on the world and be true and then live it and walk the walk because if people want to come to work for you because of that or work with you and you're not doing what you put out in the world, you're so incongruent. You're just like a, you're a hypocrite, you know? And so, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it was a super enlightening, you know, process with that happening when I was in Santa Monica. So. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Man. yeah. I'm big, big believer of walking your talk and you know, I don't, I don't just, uh, talk when the lights are on. I, uh, I do what I say, um, when the lights aren't on and that's, that started back in my career as an athlete, you know, right. it's, not, it's about, you know, when you're at the contest, it's about what you're doing to get to that point. And, um, yeah, so I definitely appreciate that. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting thing. If I go to put something online, you know, there's like this mental check with me that says something like, um, do I really do this or not? Right. And I'm not going to put something out there if I don't do it. And so, you know, for my restaurant stuff, it was really like, you know, hiring my, my tagline is like hire, train and sustain, you know, really hire for character because you can train people the skills. You can train them where the forks go and the knives go, and you can train them how to cook something and, you mm -hmm. know, or how to serve the right way and, and those things. And so really hire people for character and then, um, and then train people, um, there's this quote that says, you know, um, we do not rise to our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And, and so I was like, well, if we want to, we expect greatness, our owners expect greatness, our customers expect greatness. We have to train above that level. So we, when the, when the stress hits of a busy shift, we would do, you know, up to 900 to 1100 covers on 4th of July or something being across the street from the Santa Monica pier. Then we fall down to this the level of our training and our training was above the expectations of everybody involved, right? Expectations for your paychecks and those things. And then Simon Sinek level sustain an ecosystem where leaders eat last and people feel safe and those type of, th those type of things. And so I had to really work on my emotional intelligence and how I spoke to people and how I used like, um, you know, David Marquet's, you know, intent based leadership processes and things like that from his book, turn the ship around. And, and so putting all those pieces together, Right. And walking that walk and that in that tagline that I had was, you know, was really so important to me to put those things out there. And the same thing as a modern longevitarian. I was on the phone with a friend of mine the other day, 76 years old. And he goes, he goes, this isn't bullshit. You actually do this stuff, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, I do. I don't, I don't <laughs> do this stuff. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like I fast. I say that I fast every day. I don't eat until about two o'clock. I don't get hungry to one thirty. And the only days I eat before that or a random or Sundays where I have this feast day or if I am you know, plant based 100 percent the day before and I don't have a lot of protein and I stop eating really early. My fast may be just as long, but it may be like one fifteen that I eat, not like. 11 15 or 7 15 in the morning i'm not even up at 7 15 a lot of the times but um and so yeah i, I all of these things I, I i do all of these except the sauna i don't have access to a sauna right now you know on you know like dr Rhonda patrick teaches with the finnish style you know saunas but i breathe every day you know most days i meditate most days i work on my mindset every day you know i do the stuff that i wrote in my book about sleep that you can you know go to sleep.strongforlonger.com and download for free i pretty I've, I've exercised every day but two days the whole year right i mean it's like i do i do all of these things as best as i possibly can you know even when i work in restaurants and working 10 12 hours a day i would try to do every single one of these things so that's awesome and that, that reminds me of um like a I, I feel like I say I have a lot of favorite quotes, but a, a quote that I've come across in the last few months that stands out to me, I forget who said it, but it's, um, it goes, we don't choose our destiny. We choose our habits and our habits create our destiny. Mm. Yeah. That's uh, that's very similar to the Abraham Lincoln one was is like, you can, you, the best way to, to, to have the future you want is to create it or something like something along those lines. Right. But yeah, that's amazing. You're right. And I think that like right now, if you took your shirt off or you went in front of the mirror, right? If you're a girl and you didn't take your shirt off, but you like you're in your bikini or whatever, and you took a snapshot of where you are right now, that is the snapshot of what your habits have led to where you are at the moment. It's like looking at your bank statement today. Like if you open up your bank account and your investment account, your retirement account, and one of those things, that's basically a snapshot of your money habits, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so your body is a snapshot of your health habits, right? I mean, you're a fit guy, right? But you also you know, had multiple brain tumors. Right. And so those are, could be a genetic piece, but it's also a expression of your genetics as well. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the same thing for me, I did a, I did a candida cleanse. My entire body broke out in a rash. Right. And, and so 
I had candida. That's an expression of what my microbiota was at at the time. And I changed that expression by doing this cleanse. Right. And so yeah. all those things happen. And I'm like, I was thinking this morning, I was like, maybe I need to do it again. Right. Maybe I did see it, see if it, if, if I still have this overgrowth of a fungal overgrowth in my body and do that. And what that tells me is that I'm human, right? Mm -hmm. Even though that I am the modern longevitarian, I do all these things. I can't control the genetic expression that was passed down to me by my parents, but I can control what I do today. And then what I teach my kids for tomorrow and what I teach my coaching clients and, and those things. So, yeah. hundred percent. So hundred percent. So we got to wrap it up. This, I think this is the longest show in history for me, right? An hour and 11 minutes. Right? <laughs> um, but I, I, we could go on and I say this to almost every guest. I think we could talk for another four hours. About yeah. all of these things. <laughs> um, but you've been an inspiration to me in just the short time we've met listening to your story. Um, and I know that your story impacts a lot of people And um, and I just want to say thank you for sharing it. Thank you for putting it out there in the world. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been, been amazing. Thanks. Oh, thank you, man. I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to share and the, the love and support means the world to me. So like I said, you know, starting out on this journey as a 16, 17 year old kid, just wanting to ride my bike and then being asked to share my journey and um, all the things that I've done along the way, it just, it's, uh, it's, it's unfathomable. And I just, live in immense amounts of gratitude. And, um, yeah, I just, I just really appreciate the time and thank you for the support. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure. And I'd love to have you back on when you're, when you're doing your book tour. So we talk about your new book and do all those things and help, you know, um, you, you know, help, help get the word out that way as well. I'd love to have you on. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. This is episode 67. I've had zero repeat guests at, at this point. I have your guest number two in a seven guest stretch. So no solo episodes for seven, seven shows. And maybe that's why I'm talking a little bit longer in the segments because I'm not <laughs> able to deliver the, the speech or do those things. But um, thanks again. It's um, just time to wrap it up. And I just want to thank everybody for watching. My name is Scott Stanfield. Today's guest, Josh Perry. You can find him at joshperrybmx.com or joshperrybmx.com on any social media platform he and I met on LinkedIn. So if you're there, just go hit him up for a follow and, uh, and reach out to him, connect with him. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. It's time to roll the credits. Cheers. <laughs>